thank you everybody for joining. Happy spring. <laughs> so it'll be here by June 1st. Uh, so uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, who's a member of our class of 1967. Uh, grew up in a blue-collar family in New York City. Uh, mom was an EMT nurse. Uh, father served in the fire department. Uh, came to Alfred, and it was a process, as he'll say, of self-discovery. Uh, came to us to study engineering. It took him longer than four years to finish. <laughs> it was part of that self-discovery. Um, and he'll say, I think, Peter, fair to say that uh, the GPA was below 3.0, <laughs> as part of, especially the first several semesters with us, but then really found his traction. Uh, was involved in a variety of activities as a student. The smaller environment allowed him to grow. Uh, he booked acts, for example. He was the first, uh, he brought the first soul act, Alfred University, Wilson Pickett. Um, and very good at spotting trends. Uh, from here, served uh, the nation and the Navy in Vietnam. Uh, along the way, met his wife Maris, who's with us tonight as well. Where's Maris? And uh, Maris um, and Peter are big supporters of Alfred University. Uh, you might have heard of the uh, Maris Cuneo Equine Park. Uh, that's courtesy of Maris's uh, generosity and Peter's support as well. And they got a chance to visit the equestrian park earlier today. Uh, Peter then went from the Navy to Harvard Business School, um, where he received his MBA, and then entered the corporate world, uh, first uh, serving in Bristol Myers Squibb, and developed a reputation for, according to Business Insider, of being one of America's top corporate turnaround artists. Uh, he will attribute part of that to his mom as an EMT nurse taking him out on calls when he was in high school. So he saw pretty gruesome stuff when he was a high school student, and it prepared him to deal with corporate train wrecks. <laughs> a number of them are uh, claims to his fame. Uh, Clairol, uh, Black & Decker, uh, Remington. He's currently helping the alum of ours who started in Chroma, uh, the glasses that correct for color blindness. He's on the board there. They had to engineer a, a management shakeup so that they could become more effective in delivering their vision improvement techniques. But his big claim to fame was uh, taking Marvel Comics when it was in bankruptcy, just out of bankruptcy, had only three million in the bank. And within a few years, he had repositioned it uh, into Marvel Entertainment, uh, sold it to Disney for 4.5 billion. The case at Harvard Business School that deals with that turnaround is the best-selling case of all time at Harvard Business School. And he still lectures about it widely. Uh, you never want to have coffee before you meet with Peter. He's always active. Um, he's currently on four different boards, three of them publicly traded. Uh, one of them is elect Electrocare uh, that has an FDA-approved technology to deal with migraines um, that uh, applies the particular technology to the vagus nerve. He started a special acquisition, special purpose acquisition corporation, or a SPAC, and they engineered the most successful technology uh, IPO in UK history. About a year ago, a rival um, company, they uh, customized production of electric vehicles, such as taxis, uh, delivery vehicles, buses, et cetera, but very unique manufacturing process. Um, he's also involved with uh, Beyond View, which is a metaverse uh, on the West Coast. Uh, he's got a company with Maris that uh, produces different blends of red wines uh, that's been featured on Shark Tank. So uh, constantly on the go, and uh, imagine uh, throughout his career that pattern will continue. He's also very involved philanthropically. He's been a member of our Board of Trustees, is a past chair of the Board of Trustees, is now a life trustee member. He's a member of the board of the National Archives, uh, which holds billions of documents. Uh, he's a member of the National Police Foundation and has been uh, instrumental in them better positioning it and improving policing techniques. Uh, he was gonna be our commencement speaker in 2020 and receive an honorary degree at that time. Uh, the board had voted it at the end of January and then COVID hit. Uh, he still helped us out by Zoom uh, at that May commencement. 
Uh, last year, Soledad O'Brien uh, was our commencement keynote speaker through a connection with Peter Cunio, so very well wired into the media world, and he's brought us numerous such contacts over the course of uh, his relationship with Alfred University. Um, and we're very pleased to have him here as a speaker. He's going to be talking about how can you become a superhero leader. So without further ado, Peter Cunio. Thank you, President Zupan. I appreciate it very much. Um, before we start, I just wanted to say thanks because we often forget to do this to the people who helped set this presentation together. So I just want to call out, of course, President Zupan, but uh, Vice President Aaron uh, uh, Martin, I'm going to get this wrong, Aaron. Okay, Aaron. <laughs> uh, Mary McAllister, uh, Robin uh, Majera, uh, Lisa Sexsmith, um, Amelia Smith, and the sound and video staff, Jojo, Dan, and Dan, were all very helpful. So thank you. Um, we will have uh, Q&A after our presentation, and, uh, but I'm happy to answer questions as we go along as well, if you're motivated to ask. Um, you know, the topic tonight is, is up here. How do you, how do you become a, a, you know, a superhero leader? And um, I think, you know, wh why is this the topic? particularly for tonight. And it's really because I actually think very strongly that there's less quality leadership in the world than at any time in human history. And I, we can debate it, but uh, we are ge generally speaking lacking uh, uh, the true leaders that human, human history has had in the past. And we'll talk about some more of that. And so I think that there's a tremendous opportunity for people really of all ages, but certainly particularly of younger age, if they can become very good leaders, learn how to do that. We're going to talk about that. Uh, they, have a, they can kill it. They can crush it in their lives because they're going to have very little competition in the world of leadership. Um, so uh, I, again, though, this particular presentation is for all of you of any age any background whatsoever. Hopefully all of you, you know, every speaker always wishes if you take away one or two things from their presentation, they will be very, very happy, and I hope that happens tonight. I want to start with a little background on the presentation, um, and it talks to my interest in leadership. Um, so a little bit of quick history, because up until about 25 years ago, although I Done, accomplished a lot of things, as you heard. I really never thought about it. It was just an adventure. I never really thought about a, a leadership and how it actually comes together and, and what have you. And I was asked to make a speech on leadership when I was the CEO of Marvel Entertainment. And I uh, really didn't know what I would talk about. It just so happened I had a long flight nonstop to China for I think it was an 11-hour flight, and I started writing things I thought were important, were what I call the essentials of true, and in my case, turnaround leadership. But it just means of change leadership. Uh, and nine hours later, I suddenly came out of my trance, and I had 28 essentials leader that I thought I had learned in my career at that time. And that was over 20 years ago, and I've been giving speeches and talks and uh, whatever, uh, about those essentials now for 20 years all around the world. I've been everywhere from Buenos Aires to Beijing to uh, every major uh, school in, in Europe and uh, here in the U.S. also virtually every corner of Europe uh, talking about leadership. Um, today, I've, there's 32 essentials. I've added four over time, but only four, so so on and so forth. We're not going to be going through 32 essentials tonight, uh, but, I, but I will talk a little bit about, um, you know, a few of the essentials that I feel have, have caught in people's attention. And I think the reason, there's, here's a list, the reason they've caught people's attention is because I think that people talk about leadership 
really don't talk this way very often. At least this is what I've heard from as feedback to the, to the, um, to the talks I've done. I do think that these apply to any leadership situation. As I said, it, I, I say turnarounds because that's my field, but in business, but it's really any situation where you are a leader, you need to make change because that's what leadership is actually all about, making change. So a couple of things, I'll talk about how I learned some of these things, and I've grasped them as, as really uh, some, as I say, essentials of my philosophies about, about leadership and what I do every day. And the first one is admit your mistakes. Now, we all have uh, met, met people and worked with people, or sometimes for people, leaders, who would never admit they made a mistake, and in fact thought that that was a sign of weakness to the rest of the organization. And I might have thought that too, except for an incident that happened to me in the v Vietnam War. I was a, uh, a young officer on a guided missile destroyer. And we were uh, off of North Vietnam uh, on the, what's called the mid-watch, which is, is midnight to four in the morning. And because I was new, all I had to do, I was just observing, I had no real duties. And when a ship, a Navy ship, is in the combat zone, the captain basically never leaves the bridge, except to do a few hygiene things. He actually sleeps in his chair at the bridge. And you typically go on what we would call the gun line for 30 days. And you can imagine that the captain is pretty tired at the end of 30 days. The captain doesn't give orders to the helmsman or to the engineer or telegraph. That, people tend to think that's the case. but. But the bridge has someone called the officer of the deck that is qualified to do that. And so I don't know who actually drives the ship. The captain has many other things to think about than shouting orders to the helmsman. Um, so uh, it's the middle of the night. We are on a mission called plane guarding. So when carriers launch or recover aircraft, they want a destroyer one nautical mile in front and one nautical mile behind and obviously, we're on lifeguard duty. If a plane goes in the water, we hope to pick up the pilots. The most dangerous moment for Navy flyers is landing on a carrier, and even more dangerous, if you can imagine, landing at night. Um, and so this is a, a time when it's very sensitive. And uh, the also that we got the order to take station behind the carrier. The carrier was about to re recover aircraft. And the officer of the deck gave the orders to the helms to what course and speed to take. Captain woke up, did his own calculation, countermanded the order, and put something else in. And I could even tell something wasn't right, just as a newbie. And about one minute later, we were about to cut the other destroyer in half. And the only time in my Navy career I heard a hard rudder given but we managed to get around this, this, other, uh, this other ship, and so no one was hurt, but it was very, very close. And the next day, of course, the ship is buzzing. Well, the captain, well, can we trust this captain? He could get us killed, because on a Navy ship, everybody knows everything. There's 300 personnel on this particular ship, and everybody knows everything that's going on. It's like a little community, um, and that's the buzz on the ship. And the captain calls a meeting of all of the officers, except the ones on watch, in the, in the officer's dining room. And he starts a meeting by saying, last night we had an incident. I made a mistake. And I want to thoroughly analyze it so it never happens again. And I can tell you in one hour, the officers in the room went from doubting him to being will, willing to die for him. Because he was basically saying in doing that, your safety is more important to me than my career. Because obviously, if he'd made, he'd made it turned out okay, but he made a difficult uh, mistake, and uh, that could have definitely affected his career if it was in the log and what have you, which it might have been, I don't even know. And I remember thinking, wow, it's okay to admit when you made a mistake. Now, if you're making mistakes every day, that's a different issue, of course, but there's nothing wrong with that. You're not weak and you fix the problem. And I was very taken by that. Second one here is find a few uh, who will level with you even when it hurts. So we all have a self-image. 
Some of us have a very strong self-image. Some have a, a very, you know, we're not sure what our self-image is, particularly when we're younger. But generally, we have a strong self-image, and it's an image that makes us comfortable with ourselves. But every once in a while, frankly, our self-image isn't accurate. And we need people sometimes who can do it right to let us know that our self-image is wrong. And I've had that experience on a number of occasions where I had to do a little self-adjusting. And one of them goes back 40 years um, in which my staff came in one day and said, Peter, we, we don't think you really care what we think when you ask for our advice. Because it, what happens is you answer your own question. And I was devastated because I like to think I'm you know, really good with people and blah, 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 blah. But I knew when I thought about it that they were absolutely right. And it's something about my personality and having a mental list of getting things done every, every day and, this, and rushing through. And they were absolutely right. But I was frankly devastated. And uh, today, uh, every time I go to a meeting, it crosses my mind that I have to listen and let other people talk. If I grade myself, if I was an F then, you know, maybe I'm a C or a C plus now. I can never be an A. It's just not in me. So I have to fight that, that addiction in a way for every meeting. Um, but luckily, I had people who cared enough about me to come in, take a risk, tell me, hey, Peter, you, you, you're, you're off base. A new culture, the waltz or the tango, this is very simply the value system of an organization. When you go into an organization, you know you're going to have to make change. Very often, the, the, the uh, company may be bankrupt or not financially, but the culture is always bankrupt. The value session of the company is wrong. And I'll, I can give you a bunch of examples, but for example, the waltz. Well, the waltz is the right is the right value system, the right dance, if you will, for a company that's highly regulated. If you're running a bank, for example, you're going to want to be very careful with other people's money. Oh, you're going to have a lot of people who have to approve certain decisions and so on. And that's the appropriate dance, the waltz. But if you're in a creative business, as I've been, and an example would be Marvel, or, but in this case, I'll say an advertising agency, you want to dance the tango because you want to be very, very creative, very pushing outside the box. Any idea is not a stupid idea, is worth considering. That's the right way. But if you're in a bank and you're doing the tango when you arrive, you, you have a, or vice versa, if you're an advertising agency and you're doing the waltz, you have a problem also as a leader. So you have to evaluate what the right dance is for that particular uh, situation. Remember your, your failures and forget your successes. I have to say that I remember almost nothing of, and, I, and it was a very nice introduction I got by Mark, and yeah, Marvel turned out great and what have you. I only remember the details from 40,000 feet. But believe me, I didn't make every decision right. And boy, do I remember the details of every failure, the gory details. But that's where I learned most about myself and how to lead. It was from the mistakes. Now you have to be honest with yourself. It's very important. Some people can't be honest with themselves. If something goes wrong, it's bad luck. Or it's someone else's fault. They just can't live with they did something. We all know people like this. You know, we see them all the time. It's unfortunate. But those people will never be, be leaders, much less good leaders. Um, I'm often asked on the 32 essentials, what's the, what's the one of the 32? We don't have a lot of time. What's the one that's the hardest of the 32 to, 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 live, to live up to? And it's the next one, true emotional maturity. Okay, You can't make everybody happy. I'm not, uh, it's very interesting, but human, basically human beings don't like a lot of change. They don't. You like to be in a pattern that you're comfortable in. You like to repeat that pattern every day. Yeah, maybe you want a little change from time to time. Your office changes, you get a raise, uh, or you, know, you move on. But mostly, people don't like change. Even good change will upset some people. Okay? 
but you have to be, as a leader, con comfortable with the fact that there will, you are going to make people unhappy with some of your changes. You're going to be unpopular. I have today still people from turnarounds I did three decades ago crapping on me. I'm serious. When, when people ask, What's about, what about this guy, Cuneo? Now, I fired them, so maybe that's the reason they're unhappy, but, <laughs> but you know, it, was, it, it still exists. But you have to be comfortable with that if you're really going to make positive change. Um, and finally, this one gets a lot of attention. I often get a little murmur from the audiences. Be ruthless when called for. And this is the other thing. We all want to say, OK, this is a terrible situation. This person did a very bad thing or whatever. But maybe we can work it out. Maybe I can let me to. No. No. We have to be ruthless. And the area that I particularly want to talk about very quickly here is my experience with sexual harassment. There's no plus or minus here. None. And I had an incident once in which uh, two uh, females who were really outstanding performers, vice presidents, came to me after I was in a new job for about a month as a, as a CEO. And, and they were obviously very unhappy and upset, I could tell. And they took a lot of courage. They said their boss, who was almost world famous in his field, was so sexually harassing them. I and I'm not going to go through the details with you. It doesn't matter. Trust me, it was open and shut. There was no interpretation needed. And I had him come in, and I kind of baited him you know, about this, like, ha, 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 ha. And uh, he admitted the whole thing and thought it was very funny. And I fired him immediately. I was ruthless. And in fact, which was interesting is the, I was, this is a division of a very large company. And the, the head of HR of the large company called me up and said, you can't fire anyone without talking to us first. That was a terrible thing you did. And I said to him, well, guess what? I'm going to do it again if I run into this. So get used to it. He never called me back. <laughs> There are times when you must be ruthless. Laziness that hurts the company. Um, I've had situations of people stealing from the company, discovered they're gone. They're gone. The cops are coming in to arrest them, literally. Um, if you're interested in the 32 essentials, you know, we can, um, I'll make sure through Mark or, or anyone you'd like, I can get you the full list, no problem. And you might want to grade yourself. Be honest with yourself. You know, I grade myself. I don't get straight A's, and I'll never be able to get straight A's. Okay, but you know, take a look and see what you think. You know, on this list, and it's not a complete list. It's my list. You you might try to develop your own list if you like. That's okay too. All right. So you know, what about the the, pre the main presentation today? Well, you know, as I just said. If you can develop your grandchildren, your kids, your college students, or, or others, and I, this is about at any age, into good leaders, they are going to really be successful because they have very little competition. And so as I was talking you know, the last five years, uh, my presentation has evolved. As I started to get questions from the audience, how can I, what can I do specifically for my child, my grandson, my granddaughter, whatever, for them to learn leadership. What are some of those? And that's what I'm here tonight to talk about, how, how I think I see that. So a couple of questions we're going to try to answer tonight. You know, the first is how do you define leadership? Now, you may think, well, that's pretty simple, pretty straight up, but I'd ask all of you to spend 30 seconds, thinking about your own definition, and I would do it in the simplest terms possible. You'd be surprised how many different uh, points of view will come up on this, and I'll give you my point of view for what it's worth. Uh, the second thing is, why is there less leadership? And why am I saying this? You know, what's wrong? Why? And what can you do to avoid some pitfalls today? Are leaders made or born? I really hate when someone says, oh, he is a born leader. She is a born leader. OK, we're going to get into this in a minute. But there are no born leaders. Trust me. It's impossible. OK, and we'll talk about that. You know, so, so where do these leadership lessons come from? 
Um, some characteristics of strong leaders. I think many you'll, you'll recognize. And then um, um, leadership comes from diverse experiences. We're going to talk a little bit more, uh, more about that in a little bit. Again, some specifics. And, you know, for those of you engaged at Alfred, which is, I think, most people in the room, how can Alfred help? How can Alfred help you to become a good, if not a great leader? So the first point here, of course, is how do you define leadership? Okay, this is really very simple. It's a willingness to convince others, you know, to act in a way that's beneficial to a group or to another individual. Not everybody wants to be. I put willingness because I've had people that I've said, I have great news for you. You're getting promoted. You're going to get more money, a better title, a big office, and you're going to have 10 people reporting to you. And they look at me and say, I don't want the job. Because they don't want the responsibility. And that's OK. That's OK. You know? But it's so when I had to put the word willingness in here, which sounds obvious, but it actually it isn't. You have to be you know, ready to do that. And of course, in the end, great leaders create positive changes. So I once got a question, is, is Adolf Hitler a great leader? And I said, did he create any positive changes? I think the answer is pretty clear, you know, uh, and so on. So um, strongly, there are different leadership styles. They can be very strong and outgoing. They can be very subtle. That's OK. There is no one style that you need to adopt. You adopt your own style. Just follow the principles. You could be a very subtle leader. That's great. Um, or you could be very strong. Just being strong doesn't make you good. As I said, Hitler was, was uh, great. Now, another strong leader that I do uh, re really admire, and I'm a student of history, we'll talk about that, is Winston Churchill. If you ever want to understand a strong, great leader in a moment of true greatness, and I mean this, go online and listen to the 12-minute speech that Churchill gave his famous will will fight them on the beaches speech. So the background, and there's a very good film a couple of years ago with Gary Oldman, who won the Academy Award, The Finest Hours. And I, I really recommend it to you. But basically, the Nazis had just con 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 uh, conquered Europe. They were threatening and, and bombing uh, England. Most of the politicians in England wanted Churchill to negotiate a peace with Hitler. And Churchill basically couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. He was in an extreme minority. But he went, uh, he, he went on the radio, and he gave a speech to the entire British Commonwealth. And in, in 12 minutes, in 12 minutes, he probably rallied the, everyone in the, in the British Commonwealth to his point of view. You must, just 12 minutes, that's all it took. So if you want to hear greatness, you know, um, I, I really recommend that to you. So why is there less quality of leadership today? Well, first of all, you know, leadership comes from, from your experiences in face-to-face, face-to-face interaction with other human beings. That's where you're going to, and the more diverse that is, and we'll talk about that, the better. But that's where you learn the instincts of leadership. You are not born with those instincts. Okay? Um, and while the internet is uh, very useful in many cases, it's also very impersonal and often cruel. And we all know, you know, people will say things on the internet they'd never say face to face. Never. And it's so easy. And it's so wrong. And we have children, college students, committing suicide over bullying and what have you. And it's ridiculous. But if you are really taking that seriously, you'll never learn that those people are nuts. And you should just not take, they're not worth anything. But it's very hard to do that. So you have to. The, the internet can be very useful and fun, don't get me wrong, but it's also our enemy. 
And you have to be very careful in how you use it. We also have a, a, a culture that's become very celebrity oriented and very frivolous. If you are someone who's really concerned about what Kim Kardashian had for breakfast, <laughs> uh, you probably are not going to be you know, a leader, okay? And we have a great many of our population, again, unfortunately, they've grown up with this, okay? That are making s heroes out of celebrities, and frankly, I call some of these celebrities non-celebrity celebrities, because I can't see why anyone would look up to them at all. So you have that, that factor that hurts us also. And then we have the parents, so-called helicopter parents, who try to make a perfect world for their kids. A bad grade, oh, it's the teacher's fault. Bad teacher. You, know, you didn't make that elite team or any team. Coach, bad coach. Coach is probably, you're great, you're great. You know what basic human nature is in the end? Basic human nature can be boiled down to this, to be successful as a human being. It's really simple. You have, human beings have to learn, first of all, what they're good at and what they're not good at. Now, those kids, unfortunately, never learn what they're not good at. And there, I've had Ivy League graduates I've had to fire because they had that kind of life. And they basically you know, had no interpersonal skills at all. Uh, because everything was, and they just came in like, oh, next year I'll get this promotion. It's like automatic. They, they were fully expected. They're not bad people. They're nice people. They're intelligent, but they just can't cut it at all. So it's all about, you know, the, the, the helicopter parents, which I think are, uh, are, are, are very much an issue. You have to learn, kids, kids, everybody, we all, if we haven't yet in this room, we should learn what we're good at, what we're not good at. And we're not good at everything. We're, we're human beings. We fail. We're, we're weak at some things. We're human beings. And, and it's very simple. The things we're not good at, we have two choices. Avoid or work to get better. But make the choice, okay. When, when you don't have that basic feeling about life and about yourself, you can't be successful. You, you, you just can't. Also, selflessness. Selflessness is, is not rewarded as much as it used to be. Doing something outside yourself, not to your benefit, but to the benefit of others. Where do we see this the worst? We all know this. Politics today. We have politicians who will say or do anything to, to get reelected, even when they know they know it's wrong. There's no hesitation on a law. Not every politician, but most. And the reason we don't have good politicians is anybody who's good doesn't want to get in that field. Really. It's so awful. It's so awful. And this is one of the areas where we talk about not having good leadership. There was a time when public service in the United States was a really noble thing. You worked for other people. Yeah, you made a say, yeah, whatever. But basically, you did that. We don't see too much of that anymore. There's still some, certainly. It's not all gone. But the, 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 the feeling about, of selflessness, the rewards of that, many people never experience, so they don't know how to do it. Well, I think you know the answer, my, my point of view on this next question. Our, our, our leaders, sorry. OK, sorry. Uh, are leaders born or are they made? I obviously don't think they're born. They are made. And, and how do you learn leadership? It really boils down to something very simple. The more experiences you have going through life di with diverse situations in face-to-face -face human interactions, the better. Now, diversity for me takes three, three uh, you know, it involves three different things. It involves people. The greatest gift my parents gave me growing up, and they gave me many, is I was raised with zero prejudices about people. I never heard a word about any person because of their color, their religion, their ethnic background, whatever. Never. And my parents all had a, a, a menagerie of friends. And so that's what I grew up with. I never was weighted down by those, pre those prejudices 
that people have weight them down. And most people with those strong prejudices are frankly very unhappy people. And they usually don't think much of themselves. So they have to put it on somebody else. It's really pretty simple. Or if you've been raised in a certain place, you heard this crap every day growing up as a kid, you think it's real. You think it's real. My parents gave me uh, a, a great gift. And um, you need to have those experiences. You also need to have geographic experience. Okay? C travel. Go overseas. Go to other places. When I was eight years old, my father was called up to go as a Navy officer to the uh, Korean War. And we lived first in Queens, New York. Then we lived in Pensacola, Florida. Then we lived in Bremerton, Washington. And then we lived in San Diego, all in about one year, moving around. And even at age eight, I could tell that there were differences in people, just regionally in the United States. And that was a lesson for me at eight. I didn't really think about it consciously so much. But that. So that's really started my, if you will, my adventures in diversity. Um, and and you know, I think that it's, so the geography is very, very important. And I think it's professional and personal situations, including ones that can be tough, can be trying. The more diversity, you heard my, my, my sort of resume from, uh, you know, from uh, President Zupan, and, but really it, it's all of it. You see, there's a lot of diverse stuff there. And there's a lot of stuff he didn't mention. It's a lot of little things that m m made a big effect on me when I was young. One summer, I had a summer job in New York City. I was a doorman in an exclusive part, apartment house. And I, and I basically would fill in for whoever was on vacation. And when I was the, the handyman, and I was, had no skills, that was another story. But when I was the, I, the garbage man, I could certainly figure to handle that one. But at times, there were, there were times when, when we, you know, there were just downstairs. And I would talk to the other guys on the job. And it was interesting. They were all immigrants. They were all 50, 55, 60. They came from Scotland, Ireland, Germany, Italy. And they all told me, and I was probably 20 years old, I don't remember, how great America was and how happy they were to be Americans and how crappy it was in the old country and how lucky I was to be born an American. And so at least for me, I got a sense of, again, the world and what was happening elsewhere and why I should be at least satisfied to some degree with where I was. Um, so, you know, in my own case, traveled around the U.S., as I mentioned, I've been to China 56 times, on, mostly on business, 56 times. I talk about, you know, diversity of experiences and so on, learning different cultures. In high school, I was the manager on the basketball team, my first management job. Of course, I had all, I kept the stats. I was very important. You know, the, at the end of the game, they, the team would surround me. How many rebounds did I get? How many, you know? And if I made a mistake, oh my God, you know? No, no, I had three fouls, not four, you know? But I still loved it. And yes, I had to make sure all the balls were blown up to the right pressure and so on. But that was good. I was in the mixed chorus. Mixed course. I loved singing. I have no singing voice at all, but I could blend in in the background. It was 40 people, 20 females, 20 males. But I loved going around the city and performing. And also, there were some nice looking girls in the mixed course, too. So, um, here at Alfred, I was a waiter in the brick. I also sort of was a producer of concerts here, brought a number of acts here as well. Um, you know, I, um, and then, of course, I had the experience of, of being in a war, in combat. I wish this on no one, although I will tell you that from a leadership point of view, my Vietnam experience made me. Now, I wouldn't want any of you to have to have that kind of experience. Hopefully, it will never happen. Learn leadership in other ways. Um, we're, but uh, Vietnam, my turnarounds have been all around the world about you know, 50 times. And the businesses I've been involved with have also been very diverse. Okay, everyone knows about uh, 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 
entertainment and consumer products and media, but I've also been in med medical th technology, now an electric vehicle company, which I'm chairman of. So a lot of different industries, and again, a lot of diversity. So what are some of the characteristics of strong leaders? And I, I've listed here instincts, behavior, habits, values. So really, these experiences we're about to talk about, um, you know, um, that I recommend, which is coming in a couple of slides, is how you develop instincts. Instincts are the basis for your behavior, of course. And, you, and when you behave in a certain way and you see that it's productive and, and good, that becomes a habit, that behavior. And of course, all of these harden to values, ultimately. But a couple of things. So that I think I see in a lot of great leaders, I've been privileged to get involved with a lot of great leaders. The first is they're honest with themselves. We talked a little bit about being, being honest with yourself uh, and so on. They don't hesitate to get help. So I would go into, I didn't know anything about making a movie or publishing comic books when I went to Marvel, zero. And I didn't pretend that I knew anything. And I got other people to educate me and what have you, but I got help. But how many leaders do we know are afraid to say they need help? You know it's true. Afraid to say they need help because, again, they think they look bad. Um, I think good leaders lend themselves to uh, uh, or, or really understand themselves and um, are, uh, lead themselves. You might call it that. And I think um, they make, obviously, smart decisions. Now, you can be intelligent. So here are my simple definitions. I'm assuming everyone in this room is intelligent. In fact, I'm quite sure that's true. Okay, so all of you have that. You're, you're born with that, yes. But basically, if you make smart decisions with your instincts that you've developed and your intelligence, I, you're, you're smart. If you make bad decisions, you're stupid. And we all know people who are very smart that frankly can't help but make stupid decisions despite the fact that there may be geniuses and in intelligence. Okay, so it's all about adapting your intelligence. Uh, taking risks. Now I have here a change the rules of the game, and uh, I think I've been able to do that at Marvel. People often ask me at Marvel, why were we so successful? What was the secret? Was it the movie we did, or was it the how way we did comic books or some license? Deal we do. And I say, no, it was the culture. It comes back to culture. Yeah, those things were important, but no. We basically wouldn't give in to the silly rules and the way the industry worked in, in Hollywood and in other places. We were going to do things differently. We changed the rules of that game because we just wouldn't give in to stuff that was completely nonsensical. And we, I could spend you know, an hour on just on that. But think about Tesla, changing the rules of the game. The guy who runs Tesla is controversial. You may like him, you may not like him. But they have changed the rules of the game. Apple, Netflix. The CEO of Netflix, Reed Hastings, and I used to go, year, again, way back when, 20 years ago, we would go to these uh, conferences with, uh, uh, where we talked to investors about our companies, we're just starting out, and we'd have lunch together, you know, and, and it was, they, they were just, he was just starting this thing, he'd mail you, you know, a tape, you know, and uh, you mailed it back and that kind of thing, okay? And I was doing this stuff that no one said we could do at, at Marvel, and, you, you know, they thought I was crazy. But Apple, you know, certainly was another example, changing the rules of the game. Very, very important. Not afraid. And that's the next one. Not afraid to be different. Not afraid. Go against the tide. I mentioned Churchill just a little while ago. You know, he was definitely in the minority, but he stuck to it, and the rest is glorious history, actually. Um, diving into problems. You know, really good leaders are not, are not worried about problems. They're worried about the problems they don't know about. And I often, when I come to a turnaround, the first thing I say to the senior executives are, 
you will not get in trouble if you come to me and say you have a problem because we can fix it. You will get in trouble with me if you have problems and don't tell me. It's really that simple. You've got to, they, they don't shrink, they don't think, let me think about it for a week. All the things you often hear from weak leaders. Let me get a consultant in, you know. No, dive right in. Communicate freely, obviously. Read people's uh, motivations, very, very important. Very important. That comes from the instincts that you would develop. And then uh, confident in alien environments. And again, super important. Going into some place you've never been before. Um, and, and I think th that's one, actually one of the keys because when you're successful in an alien environment, and I'm not talking about going to Mars, I'm talking about going to a new industry. I'm talking about going to a new country. I'm talking about uh, any number of things like that. You know, and you're successful, it breeds confidence. My first turnaround, I have to tell you, I love to tell you, I just, I knew I'd be great at it. I knew I had these skills. I knew it. I was depressed for six months. I was thrown into it uh, by my boss who had confidence in me that I could do this. And I had to go to Europe and work on 25 different country, countries who were selling product. I didn't know anything about overseas business. And I was very, really depressed. And then I found we started to get results and I began to see that the problem before had been leadership. Didn't have bad products, didn't have whatever. It was the leadership. And um, I started, of course, to enjoy it once I saw that I had some skills that I didn't know I had. Um, but I was definitely put off. I have two sons. They both studied abroad, one in Italy, one in France. Uh, one of them, I'm not going to name the one or the country, uh, first went, uh, it was a summer uh, in his junior year in college, and uh, he um, was very unhappy the first couple of months. To, didn't speak English, completely alien to him, and, you know, would call us and very, you know, almost wanted to say, Dad, I won't, maybe I should come home, which we'd never allow. But, you know, he was very down. Fast forward to May you know, uh, we go to visit him in this particular country, uh, and he is uh, actually completely at home, leads us around by the nose, is functional, not fluent, functional in the, in the language, and has set us all up with the right hotels and knows what restaurants to go to from maybe I should come home. Okay, so there's not, was not comfortable in an alien environment to start, but thrived eventually from it. And we were very happy with that, needless to say. So, okay. What are some of the experiences I would say to you are important if you have a young child or a, someone in high school or a college or even, even beyond that? What are, these, what are these, these experiences that, you know, diverse experiences that read leadership at any age and I'm 78 years old. I know I look like I'm 40, but you know I'm 78, and I'm still learning. I learned today talking to some students from the equestrian. Really, I learned some things. So I'm still learning about things and about leadership and about the world. Uh, the first is travel to alien environments. You hear this again, you know, and basically uh, this is, I think, a. Uh, a very important uh, situation. I would say to people, take your five-year-old to Europe. And they would immediately say to me, what do you mean? Five years old? They're, they're, they definitely can't appreciate it. It's a waste of money. And I would say, actually, I don't think it is. But if you can't go to Europe, can't afford it, that's fine. Go to Canada, go to Mexico, go to wherever, you know, and change. Five-year-old, no, they won't get it. I said, yes, they will get it. Now, the five-year-old, what, what's the five-year-old's reaction? What do they come away with on that trip? They went to some strange place, very alien to them. All they knew, basically, was home and so on. They didn't speak his language. He didn't know what they're talking about. The food was weird and different. The, the, you know, but, gee, 
I went and saw some, I saw this tower that was leaning over, it was almost falling. I remember that, that was really different. And oh, I do blah, blah, and blah, blah, and blah, blah. And what happens is, the child's not thinking I learned leadership at five, but they're coming back with confidence. It's an emotional reaction. They learned confidence. So the next time they go in some place, they're confident. And then they'll be, believe me, they'll be pushing, let's go to this country and that country and so on. So that's, even five-year-olds can get a great deal. And dad and mom are along, there's gonna be no traumas, but, but you know, are, are gonna get a, a, a great deal at a very young age about coping in an alien environment and they get confidence from that. Team sports, I think this, this is obvious. I think team sports are very important. Um, I don't care if you're the last person on the team. So my grandson uh, went, went to high school and he thought when, in his freshman year he was gonna be a starter on the football team. And there was 50 people on the team and they had a great team, they went nine and one. And uh, he was like number 48 on the team. He probably played four minutes in the entire season. Okay? And I said to him at, at the end of the season, what'd you learn? And he said something that I thought was amazing. He said, Grandpa, I learned that the best players are not the best leaders. 14 years old. So guess what? He wasn't a starter, played very little, was on the bench almost the whole time. He got a lot out of that. And he learned some instincts about leadership. Uh, individual sports are just as good if it's not a team sport. You're still competing with other people. I love performing arts as a way to get outside yourself. In my case, uh, one year, the year of, uh, I, did, I wasn't at Alfred. You know, I was in a show at uh, Queens College in, in Queens. They have something called Follies every year, but in the show, I wasn't on stage. I was pulling the curtains in the back. <laughs> and seeing the reaction when I didn't pull them right, you can imagine. Um, but I met a lot of very interesting people, very diverse, as part of, the, part of the team. I wasn't on stage, but I was still part of the team. Study abroad, and I have here, of course, no English. I think if you study abroad and you go someplace English speaking, it's not cheating, but if you, if you really can be, come go someplace where you don't speak the language. I guarantee at the end of the, the five months or whatever it is, you're going to feel so much, so much better about yourself, really. Um, again, an alien environment. Military, Peace Corps. I do think the military is a great place to learn about diversity and leadership, good and bad. Good and bad, or the Peace Corps. Peace Corps still exists and is an outstanding, and if you want to talk about selflessness, for example, I think you know, that's something you could do. You do these things for one or two years. This doesn't have to be a lifetime. Poverty, because I've been around the world so many times, I've seen poverty everywhere, and 90% of the world is in poverty, 90%. But you, to, appreci to appreciate, again, life and what you might have, that will help you understand and see how people try to cope when they have nothing. Watch natural mentors' behavior. Well, mentors are very important. And when I say natural mentors, these, um, uh, you, you know, you, know you, um, you, you don't go up to, to a, a professor in class who, who you just met and say, would you be my mentor? That doesn't work. Natural mentor means you, you have an affinity for each other, a natural affinity. You can be friends, you can be honest with each other. Okay, that's what a mentor is meant to be. Sometimes kids hear, oh, we need mentors. So, oh, oh yeah, let me, you, you, you. Would you be my mentor, would you be? No, 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 it doesn't work that way. They'll come naturally. They're very important. Now I have fail here. As I said, we're not perfect, we are gonna have failures. Okay, and you, we will learn a lot from our failures about leadership. Uh, you know, what went wrong. Of course, interactions with poor leaders, and um, I'm in the, uh, studying history. I do think you can learn a lot about leadership behavior studying history, because human nature has not changed since humans came on this earth. We all have the same feelings of, of negative and positive feelings. We may express them differently. Different cultures around the world have different body language, for example, and so on. But fundamentally, 
we're all the same. We're absolutely all the same. And, but studying history, you know, learning about, about great leaders and how they behaved and why, I think is very important. I'm on the board of the National Archives in Washington. And we have 21 billion documents. Five billion, we keep all the records of the United States government from day one, 1776. And uh, f f five billion are digital, so 16 billion are not digital. Largest collection of antique maps, of film, of photographs in the world, and so on. And I recommend to all of you, you know, if you're in Washington, go to the archives headquarters and look at the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights. We have a copy of the Magna Carta, which is the basis for all English-speaking law, which goes back 800 years, and so on. And uh, I think you'll find it, it to be very rewarding. We have a lot of great exhibits about our history in the archives, but you learn from studying history. So finally, um, could Alfred help? Well. I think just about everything I just went down can be affected through Alfred. Study abroad, study history, et cetera, et cetera, all of those things just about Alfred can help with and does. There are a couple of other things I like about Alfred, though, that I mentioned here. Um, one of the things that really helped me is I took a speech course at Alfred. Now, back then, speech was, oh, I need one more course. It's easy. Let me just throw it in. You know, speech is easy with blah, 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 blah. And I found out that I really liked doing it. And I even started competing in the American Ceramic Society. I was a glass, and glass scientist, so Ceramic Society had a, had a competition, for a public speaking competition, which I entered. I didn't win, uh, but I definitely had the best speech. But I didn't win. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, when I told my mother, she said, it's your fault, you didn't win. No, I'm kidding. Uh, I was too old by then. But um, I, I learned that I liked it. And I'm comfortable, as I hope you see today. Uh, I, I don't have a problem with doing that. And again, being able to talk to a group is very important, I think, for leadership. And then Alfred Clubs. Alfred is famous for its clubs. Alfred is famous for its diversity in the student body. I think we have the most diverse student body in upstate New York, if I remember correctly, or close to it. And uh, the clubs are very, very important. And th think about the clubs. Think about all of the things I listed about diversity and experiences and so on. Now, I know the clubs, uh, I've had a tough time during COVID, understood completely, very difficult. But I think the clubs are coming back now. And I certainly encourage the Alfred students here to be active in a couple of clubs. Oh, I think you'll learn a great deal, actually. Um, so I think, unless there are any questions, I'm going to move to Q&A. Um, the one thing I have to warn you about is that I'm expecting a call. I know I ran a little late. Um, uh, sorry. I have to answer this. I apologize. This will only take one minute. Hello? Yes. Yes. I'm sorry. I, I apologize. I, I, I really do. It's, it's emergency. OK, who is it? No, 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 no. Peter, this is not an emergency. Peter, Peter, this is not an emergency. You want to what? You want to give me back my jacket I lent you 20 years ago? No, no, Peter, Peter, really. Listen, I, I, I'm, I'm, you're, you're blowing. I, I work for months on this presentation. I'm giving a speech at Alfred University. So, you know, let's talk, let's talk uh, next week. Okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll see you in New York, okay? What? You're in Alfred now? What? what? Well, all right, look. Look, I, I don't want to disrupt this. This is already. Very embarrassing. I'll see you at the jet after we're done. How's that? <laughs> what? What? You're, you're what? You're outside the campus center, and you want to come in? Now listen, you, you, this is a, a very elite group in here. You do not qualify, OK? 
you really are not interested in, in my subject is leadership. You're not interested. So, so let's not, you know, let's not do that, okay? Um, all right, let me ask uh, President Zupan if he's here. Is, is, uh, yes, President Zupan, uh, um, I have a friend, Peter, who's on the phone. He's really like a pain in the butt, <laughs> okay? Uh, you know, he acts weird, and he's a nebbish, and he's, no, yeah. It, it, but is it all right if he comes and sits in the back? Would that be okay? Thank you, thank you. Again, I apologize. Just no one say anything to him or pay any attention to him. All right, Peter. Look, you can come in. Yeah, you can sit in the back. Okay, is is that all right? Yeah, fine. What? No, no, no. You cannot sit on the stage. No, no. You cannot sit on the stage. Please ask Mark. Mark's your friend now. You don't call him President Zupan. You don't even know the guy. What? Uh, President Zupan, it would be all right if my friend sits on the stage. Oh. Jeez. All right, will you do me a favor? Just, just don't disrupt anything, please. I know what you're like. What? You're not in civilian clothes. Uh, um, hmm. I'm so glad this is not re being recorded. I apologize. You know, just don't put this on the internet, please. What, what, whatever you do, I, I, I really can't do it. All right, um, all right, all right, come in and. Would you go ahead, you know, you want to take a seat? Great, thank you very much. <laughs> um, are you okay and then everything? No, I can't do that. I, I, no, I have to maintain an image. I cannot put on the jacket, okay? All right, so should I put on the jacket? Jeez. Oh, All right. Geez, you know, this tie costs 20 bucks. I mean, I think um, my tie is caught in the mic, so I'll, I'll leave the tie on. Ugh. So, how do I look? Hmm? Okay. You know, it feels, it actually feels pretty good. What do you think? How do I think I look okay? Huh? Hmm? Hmm? What do you think? Think it? Think it uh, you think it does, does something for me? Maybe you know. Thanks, 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 Peter. I appreciate you bringing this down. Very nice, actually. Thanks. Didn't expect this. Very nice gift after 20 years giving me my jacket back. Oh yeah. I know Daredevil's on the back, and you're upset that it's not you. I understand that, but that's what it is. So, um, well, I think um, I'd like to open. What? What did you say? You want to help make the presentation? What? You don't know anything about leadership. Come on, come on. This is unbelievable. What do you know about leadership? Get, name one thing. Name one thing. Oh yeah, I did mention alien environments a lot, <laughs> didn't I? And I made a big deal about that. Let me think. Green Goblin, Doctor Ox, uh, uh, Venom. You know what? All right, I'm going to give you that. But would you please sit down because I, I really, really need to finish this this presentation because I don't think you really know much about leadership. So. Yeah. Uh, oh. oh, you noticed what I said about mentors, huh? Well, um, who, what mentors have you had? What, what am I missing here? Oh, wait a minute. 
technical issues. Okay. So, so um, mentors. Yeah, uh, you're right. The Avengers are pretty good mentors. Yeah, uh, they were pretty good people to learn from. All right, I got to make. You made two points, but I think you. Uh, what? Another point. Mm. You do dive into problems, don't you? <laughs> and I did say that was very important. Great leaders dive into problems. And I did notice your last movie, you rescued that Harvard recruiter. <laughs> you know, I think some people here wish you hadn't, but that's a different issue. <laughs> and, and, you know, um, that you did dive right in and save her from going over the bridge. All right, fair enough. I'm beginning to wonder now. What else? You got anything else? I'm not afraid of the Hmm. Okay, so study abroad. Yeah, you've certainly studied abroad like every country in the universe, so I'll give you that one too. Um, what else? Oh, this is getting interesting. Okay, uh, you're not afraid to be different. Yeah, and, and what you just told me is, is really interesting because you told me that you wanted to be bitten by the spider. <laughs> this will be, this, this wanted to be different. No, this is gonna be headline news in every comic book in America. And this is, big, this is a big thing. Alfred better get a, a news release out right away as soon as we're done here. Um, what else? Oof. I don't remember going to the <laughs> Oh, you don't remember what's next on the page. All right, well, that's all right. I'll help you. <laughs> Your memory isn't so good. So the next one is, is you take risks. Um, yeah, you, swim on the, you swing on those webs. And by the way, please don't, don't point those, those risks at the audience. They don't want that stuff on them, okay? Yeah, but yeah, you do. Swing all over the place, and I was at it. Is taking risks, and do you fail? Do you ever fail? I don't. One time, only once. When? What was that? I couldn't get a date. Oh yes, high school. You couldn't get a date with Mary Jane <laughs> because you know, yeah, I, because you're weird. <laughs> Which, by the way, hasn't changed. By the way, someone put this picture up of you and I. We first met on a roof about 20 years ago. The thing that bothers me about this picture is you haven't aged at all. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, you haven't aged since 1962, if I recall. And, well, I look pretty good. You know, I, well, the jacket helps. The jacket helps the look. So, you know, that's fine. Um, any regrets? I mean, you've, you've apparently been, had a great life, but have you had any real regrets? Okay, so uh, Peter said that he went to Empire State University and he should have gone to Alfred. <laughs> now, Spider-Man, I, I know it's hard for you, but is, do you actually want to say anything to the, to the audience tonight? What would that be? Hello. <laughs> With great power comes great responsibility. I like this one. All right. One more thing to say. Yeah, it is. <laughs> to be good leaders, we must be aware of when tradition inhibits growth. Then we must diversify our lives by empathizing with others, and having the courage to walk our own paths. Ladies and gentlemen, Amelia Smith.
Um, I know we've run late, but I'm still happy to answer questions. Maybe Spider-Man will help me. Who knows? <laughs> I should say Spider-Woman should, should, might want to help. Is there anything that... Sure, go ahead. But then I'm just, I'm just wondering, like, how do you, like, why do you view the opposite, the opposite of what we're mostly told, like, oh, keep up the work until your success. Because I think you improve from your failures. Because if, you, if you're being honest with yourself, you're not going to want to repeat that, that mistake again. And you're going to work very hard to overcome that. I mentioned this thing about I'm not a good listener. And I, every meeting, it, it hits me. It's psychic. You know, so that's what I was trying to get at. Uh, of course, you re remember your successes, of course. Uh, I don't mean that you, I, I, I probably, to, to be more forceful, I said, don't remember your successes. No. Of course, you want to remember your successes, too. But I really do believe, if you're honest with yourself, you learn more from your, your mistakes. Yes? I'm sorry, I didn't hear. What's the cast like? Like, how is Chris Evans and Scarlett Johansson? How are they all? How are they all? Oh, you're asking about, this, about the actors? Yeah. All right, so first of all, understand that we sold to Disney in 2009, so it's been 12 years, and I have not been involved in any of the films okay. since then. Um, I, I, I'll be there in a second. You're next. I, I, uh, I, I can tell you about some of the people that I worked with you know, when, when we still own the business. One of the things that I talked about, we changed the rules of the game for the movie business. Well, what's an example? Well, one thing was the system in Hollywood, which consists of a lot of, uh, you know, agents and so on, wanted us to hire big name stars to play the lead roles. 10 million up front wouldn't be crazy at that point, okay? Our view was we don't need big stars. We only need, need big, really good actors and actresses because the stars are the characters. And the stars are the characters, and, and really, they're going to be behind the mask most of the time anyway. And so that's what we wanted. And uh, I often talk about Hugh Jackman. So Hugh Jackman Wolf, is Wolverine, and is, there's 300... X-Men and Wolverine is the most popular. And he was a song and dance man in Australia. He'd made one little movie in, in Australia. Uh, and that was it. And uh, Wolverine, you know, they of course wanted us to hire big time, um, you know, big time people. And um, we wouldn't do it. And of course the rest is history. Hugh Jackman is brilliant. He be, he's Wolverine. He's also a great guy. He's also had three hits on Broadway. You know, is a multi-talented person. Uh, Tobey Maguire as Spider-Man was similar. Didn't need a big person. Kirsten Dunst was great in that as well. And so that was our philosophy. And we just wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't pay. Now today, these actors, the other actor I talk about where we broke the rules, so to speak, was Robert Downey Jr., so when we had formed our own studio, the first couple of years we worked with big studios, but then we formed our own studio. The first film was Iron Man 1. And, you know, we, we okay, so who's going to play Tony Stark? Big decision. It's a board meeting. People running Marvel Studios come in and they say, well, we, we have a recommendation for, for Tony Stark. You know who? And it's Robert Downey Jr. And the board is What? You know, because his mug shot and his complete breakdown had been nationwide news. And he was, he looked terrible. He was all messed up. And we were like, there's no way. Well, he's the best male actor in Hollywood, and we can get him very cheap, which was true. He said, no, no, sorry. They said, okay, we know that you guys on the board were going to say no. 
So we asked Robert to screen test. Normally, big actors don't have to screen test. And we want to show you the screen test. Oh, uh, yeah, OK. So the screen test, if you remember Iron Man 1, it opens. He's in a Humvee. He's smoking a cigarette. He's got a cocktail. There's a female dr uh, uh, driver in, in her fatigues. And then they get hit, you know, and he gets a new heart, you know, cutting to the chase. So, but, so it's the screen test is the first maybe, maybe 10 minutes at most. And the first four or five minutes, he's right on the script. And then he goes off, as only Robert can. No, I mean, he goes off. And, he's at, and, and we realize suddenly, maybe he actually is Tony Stark <laughs> in real life. Because he's got the same problems Tony Stark has. <laughs> You know? Anyway, the lights come up, and the board, including me, are like this. Do it. <laughs> and you know the rest of history. And Robert never had a fallback after that either, personally, at all. He's a great actor, and he's done some great stuff. And he's actually a terrific guy. So, but again, we broke the rules of the game constantly. So, yes. I'm sorry. Over here was next. Yeah. Sure. Uh, what would you say is your biggest failure that you've ever had? And what oh. did you learn from it and what could you do? Oh, my God. <laughs> I knew that would get me in trouble. We're going to change that chart for the next time. <laughs> the biggest failure I've ever had. Oof. Oof. I should have thought this one out. Um, probably not marrying my wife sooner. <laughs> of course. Of course, we only knew each other one month when we got married. <laughs> but we could have gotten married after two weeks. So that's my big one. Any other brilliant questions? Yes. You talked about how leadership and culture were best cultivated through face-to-face -face interactions. Um, but in an increasingly virtual uh, world, mm -hmm. how would you Well, you have to maximize the, uh, the opportunities. You, ha you have the decisions that you can make that will maximize it. You can't get away from the internet completely. It's obviously impossible. And I'm not suggesting that at all. You know, um, so I'm, I did 500 Zoom calls last year. Uh, one day in my business, I, did, I think my record was eight Zoom calls, one hour each. And most of the people I'm talking to I'd never met before. And it was OK, but I really had no sense of them at all, none. The people who were on that I knew from before, yes, OK? It, you've, you've got to get out there. You've got to experience, take some risks uh, you know, and with other people, with other people. And you'll, I think you'll, you'll actually find it very exciting to do. Yes? Um, so if you, if you met Stan Lee, how was like, his personality? <laughs> Excuse me? Oh, my God. I love Stan so much. So I have a story about Stan Lee. I, I'm the new CEO of Marvel. I'm at my first Comic-Con, which back then there was only one. It was in San Diego. I think it's still one of the biggest, most, certainly the most important, because all the movie people go to that one. Okay? I think the one in New York is bigger now, but you know, it's considered pure, you know, just comic books. Uh, but so um, we're, and we're walking through the, uh, uh, the hall in, in San Diego, and um, it's shoulder to shoulder. It's very crowded. And Stan Lee is, I'm not kidding, walking through like Moses parting the waters. <laughs> and, uh, don't, and, and he's not hamming it up. It's just him. He's naturally he's a great guy. And he's walking through. He's walking through. You know, and I'm his wingman, and I'm the new guy, you know, and so. So suddenly he, he, stop, he to, stops to talk to somebody, and everyone crowds around. And there's a guy maybe five feet away from me, about 40, and he's got his son with him who looked to be maybe 12. And the guy is going to his son. I forget the son's name. We'll say it was uh, Bill. Bill, that's Stan Lee. And Bill's, going, and Bill's looking, and he says, 
Dad, who's that other guy? And he points at me. And his father says to him, Bill, that's nobody. <laughs> so, you know, don't let your ego run away from you. Yes, yes, sir. I, Do you remember why? Yeah. Um, I don't actually remember okay. what the four are. The why, though, would have been that in, in continuing to look at this every so often to see, you know, what might, might, I might add. I probably ran into some experiences, multiple experiences. Oh, I know one of them. I have uh, something in about diversity, which I think is very, very important. Uh, a diverse, diversity is strength. You know, I often say, if you get involved with people that have these prejudices, they are, they are mentally ill. It's not organic, but they're mentally ill, and they have a big sack of cement on their backs that they're carrying around. They don't make good partners in business, certainly. And, um, you know, but so I, I have a, that's one of the four that I add. It has to do with diversity. But... Um, I, I honestly, I just don't remember the other three. Yes, sir. Um, first, thank you for coming. I have two questions, if you don't mind. One is, what are the most uh, difficult challenges you see for millennials? And second, uh, I'm curious to know, what, how did you describe success when you were 25 years old, and how do you describe it? Sure. Now? Well, I, I can answer the, for the first one quickly. When I was 25... Um, I, I was in the Navy, uh, I, I wasn't married yet, and I would, the success was simple, I'll, meet, I'll, I'll get out, maybe I'll get a master's degree in something, I don't even know what, and um, I'll meet a nice girl and get married and we'll have kids and have a happy life. I literally never thought any deeper than that about it. You know, sometimes we're always held back by our environment, you know. So much of our outlook on life comes with the environment, how we're raised, how we live. You come to expect certain things, and that was my expectation. Nothing wrong with it. Uh, now, my life has been very different than that. Um, but, um, you know, you, sometimes you have to take risks. I didn't think I'd get into Harvard Business School. I did, you know, um, and I had academic honors. And I was president of the International Business Club. And, uh, but I was a terrible student at Alfred. Seriously. I, first six semesters, I was on academic probation three times. I left for a year because my father got sick. I wasn't thrown out, although it was very close. And then I came back, and I had to sort of redo my junior year. So I came back for two more years and got a degree in glass science. And the two years I came back, though, the year I was out, I... I, I matured five years because I was bringing home a paycheck to my mother and I saw what she needed the whole paycheck and I was able to come back after that and so I had a very different attitude about it and I was on Dean's list mo most of the time when I was back so I'm sorry the other question you know, what do you, how do you describe success now? And the other great question. question the first thing I would tell you is do not ever allow anyone else to define success for you. Don't let people tell you, you should do this, you should be that, you should whatever, okay? You have to go with what you feel. Some people want to make a lot of money, fine. Some people don't care about that. They want to give to others in other ways, and that's great too. But never let people define success for you. It's a, one of the biggest mistakes that I think people make. Only you can define success, okay? And um, success for me today is to continue doing what I do. At my age, most people are, are, are not working anymore. I work 24-7, and I love it. And I have an understanding wife, needless to say, <laughs> you know? 
And so that's, that's my simple definition today of success. Continue to do what I do and have some, you know, have some good outcomes. Yes. Well, you, normally when I'm working, you know, they're turnarounds, so there are no qualities. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, things are all messed up. And so what I am looking for is can, because most turnarounds fail, by the way. And so, you know, is it doable? And so I turned down a lot of potential assignments. I just didn't think they could get done. Um, but so I'm always, with Marvel, it was simple. I looked at the balance sheet as Marvel was coming out of bankruptcy. Marvel had 7,000 characters that they owned and controlled completely. And one character, where, where's Spider, Man, Woman, okay? The, the entire uh, valuation on the balance sheet for those 7,000 characters was $500 million. And I knew one character, Spider-Man, could be worth $500 million. And that's why I took the job, if, if done right. And we also had a very different attitude. So we viewed ourselves as the character's agents. That's how we did this. So we're, we, we, OK, the, each character has a career. They're going to make a movie here. They're going to do this license here. They're going to do something else there. The difference with us and agents is agents get 15%. We got everything. But basically, it's, that's the way we looked at this, you know? What's, what's right for the character and, uh, and so on? And what's the character going to do three years from now? So I guess one more? Or? OK, sure. Yes? Um, you got the benefit of having a long life to look back over. Is there any one or two things that you wish you had known when you were younger? Mm, geez, these questions, you know, I like this because I'm stumped and, you know, it shows us some very smart people in the audience. Uh, oh. Yes, I'll tell you, uh, actually, there's something, um, and th I'm not fooling with this one. Um, I wish that I'd spent a lot more time with my grandparents understanding their life. Uh, my grandparents, three of them were immigrants, uh, two from um, Canada via Scotland. I'm half MacLeod, and one from Italy, Cuneo, my last name, and, and um, uh, my grandmother f uh, from Sweden. And I really wish, you know, I was more into me and what I was doing, and sometimes even seeing my grandparents was like, uh, do I have to? And I really, now that I'm older and I'm trying to interest my grandkids in, in you know, our family histories, um, and uh, I do wish that I knew more about than going on, uh, you know, ancestry and trying to figure out their backgrounds. So I think it was something that I could have learned a lot from that I miss. Okay. Thank you. Do you want, you want me with my jacket on? Is that all right? Please join me in thanking Peter for coming back to campus. And then if you'd indulge us just for a few more minutes, this is something that's almost two years overdue. And so I'd like to ask our board chair, Greg Connors, to join me. Uh, in May 2020, we were going to award an honorary degree uh, to Peter Cuneo. Uh, last night at uh, dinner, um, the student asked him, well, what made, uh, when you were part of Marvel Entertainment's, uh, the movie so successful? And he said, uh, character development. That people bond emotionally when they see somebody develop. And that's at the heart of what makes Alfred University a special place. And it's something we can keep aspiring to, uh, just to see the transformation that happened and the lessons that Peter drew on and keeps drawing on from here and then beyond. Uh, so uh, without further ado, and Peter, uh, it's rare for him to wear a tie. Uh, he was our first board chair that uh, said uh, ties and more formal attire are gonna go out the window. He didn't wanna do regalia tonight. We usually provide a hood to an honorary degree recipient. Uh, 
He didn't want to do that either. We'll, we'll still present him with the hood, but we do have a citation to read to him and to present to him. Thanks, yeah, and I followed Peter's rule. I didn't wear my tie, he wore the ties. <laughs> um, so I, I'd like to answer your question uh, about what do I think Peter's biggest failure is. I think Peter's <laughs> biggest failure was probably the former football player turned lawyer from Hornell that he adopted or reappointed to be a chairman someday. I think that's probably <laughs> his biggest failure. Um, and, and I just want to add, I want to thank Maris for sharing Peter with us for all these years. Um, <laughs> Peter just doesn't talk the talk. Peter walks the walk. And, uh, and, and, and kind of remedying some of his failures, the biggest failure of appointing me as the chair is, is he is a tremendous mentor. Um, he answered every time I called, just <laughs> like he did here tonight. Um, and he would meet me in New York whenever I needed some advice uh, and, and some guidance. And so Peter Cunio is not just somebody who talks about it. Peter, he's somebody who actually does it. Uh, and I want to thank Maris for always sharing him with us and, and with me and with the university, and thank you for being also a tremendous supporter of Alfred. <laughs> On behalf of the Board of uh, Trustees from Alfred University, Mr. President, students, staff, faculty, and guests, I am pleased to present to you Peter Cuneo, a 1967 graduate of Alfred University who served 27 years on our Board of Trustees, six years as Chairman. Uh, he was conferred as Chair Emeritus Life Trustee in 2020. In 2013, he was awarded the degree Doctor of Human Letters, Honus Causa. Uh, Peter has, is highly regarded in the business world for successfully turning around several struggling businesses, most notably Marvel Entertainment. When he became president in 1999, Marvel was a comic book publisher just emerging from bankruptcy, Peter re re revitalized the company, transforming it into Marvel, Enta Marvel Entertainment, and then selling it to Disney Corporation for $4.5 billion. In 2019, he created CHG Merger Corp, um, a company that he works with his, his two sons, which I truly admire, uh, a special purpose acquisition company that merged with British electric vehicle startup for a combined valuation estimate of $5.4 billion. He has graciously given his time to his alma mater. Peter is a sought after speaker throughout the world who has made speeches on leadership and who today presented on leadership here at the Alfred University campus community during which he spoke about this illustrious career as a business turnaround specialist. He was our keynote speaker as mentioned for in 2020 and was instrumental in recruiting Soledad O'Brien, an award winning television journalist as the commencement speaker in 2021. During his tenure on the board, Peter served as the human resource chair, executive committee chair and vice chair, admissions committee chair, facilities and grounds, strategic planning chair, trusteeship and the trusteeship committee. He also served on the endowment campaign planning and campaign steering committees. He was the chair of the building on excellence campaign. Peter got the efforts that raised $155 million for our university which included funding for the Miller Theater, the McGee Pavilion, as well as Ann's House and Joel's House, both residence halls here on campus. The university also received an endowment gift that led to the naming of the Intramural School of Engineering and then the creation of the Intramural Kiyosari Fine Ceramics Museum. In addition to guiding philanthropic efforts for Alfred University, Peter has been generous in giving to his alma mater. He and his wife Maris have been ardent supporters of the university's inquestry program. Their philanthropy provided resources which helped create the Maris Cuneo Equine Park, home to our world-class equestrian facility, and one of the top equestrian programs in the country. As part of Alfred University's last campaign, Peter matched alumni investment in the university through the Cuneo Challenge for Alfred Fund. Mr. President, I am honored to present Peter Cuneo for the conferral of the of the degree of Doctor of Commerce, Honest Causa, in recognition of his professional career and his service and generosity to Alfred University and its students, given under our sign and seal the 19th day of April 2022. Thank you, buddy. Thank you, Thank you so much. I can't, I can't believe I'm getting another one. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Is this? but it's, it's not official yet.
Chair Connors. In recognition of these accomplishments and by virtue of the authority vested in me by our Board of Trustees of Alfred University, I confer upon you, F. Peter Cuneo, the degree of Doctor of Commerce, honoris causa, with all the rights, privileges, and responsibilities thereto appertaining, and in token whereof, I cause you to be vested with the hood of the degree, or given the hood of the degree, and instruct <laughs> that your status be changed, be charged in the membership role of Alfred University, now a three-time alum, uh, two doctorates, very outside of ordinary, but so is Peter Cuneo. Congratulations, Dr. Dr. Cuneo. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. That's great. Yes. Thank you so much. That's it. That's it. Thank you. <laughs>